go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the Dataversity webinar, including all your mission critical data in modern apps and analytics, sponsored today by Precisely. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom before Faults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. And to find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Ashwin Ramachandran. Ashwin is the Senior Direct Director of Product Management for the Precisely Connect product family. In his seven plus years of Precisely, he has enjoyed having a front row seat watching enterprises adopt uh, and react to the progressive waves of techno techno technological, excuse me, I'm all tongue tied today, change taking hold from legacy data warehousing to Hadoop to modern cloud data warehousing, machine learning and AI. He is particularly passionate about identifying opportunities for how precisely can help customers overcome their pressing business challenges as these waves of technology continue to take hold. And with that, I will give the floor to Ashman to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon. Really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to present today on this topic. So I guess with that said, uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, so as Shannon mentioned, uh, the subject of today's talk is uh, really ensuring that data for projects, uh, whether that be analytics or, or building modern applications, include all of an enterprise's mission critical data. Uh, the agenda that we've got today is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to start out by talking about modernization, the benefits, and then the associated challenges with reaching those goals. Um, I'll then dive into complexities specifically related to what we precisely see as mission critical data assets. Uh, and from there, I'll, I'll pivot towards talking about some solutions and, and how precisely assists our 12,000 plus customers with these um, you know, with these solutions to navigate the complexity. And then I'll close out today before we jump into Q&A with uh, a really interesting customer story that I particularly enjoy going through. Um, so with that, let's talk, let's start talking about um, the, the main topic, right? Um, what are some of the benefits of modern analytics platforms? I'm not going to be the first to say any of these items, right? But my my goal here is to really summarize a lot of the key things we see our customers looking to get out of modern data platforms, modern analytics platforms, et cetera. Um, you know, when you take a look at modern analytics platforms or data platforms built on top of hyperscalers like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, et cetera, um, you know, clearly they offer an ability to kind of get visibility into all of an organization's data, right? So you can kind of get uh, a consistent view of your data that's that's accurate um, and solves for a complex multi-platform uh, data environment, right? With that set, you now have the opportunity to enable competitive differentiation, right? Through the variety of services that may exist on these different platforms, you can maybe build a more real-time application that's built on data that comes from across the business and not just an individual silo. Um, another key benefit we see our customers continue to leverage is an opportunity to optimize their existing spend. Right in nine out of 10 cases, there is a, a cost savings to be realized by moving from a static, say, warehouse on premises in your data center that's allocated for the maximum capacity that you hit one day out of a month, right? And instead move towards paying exactly for, for what you use and doing that at a much more cost effective price per bit, as it were, right? Um, you can handle petabyte scale workloads at, at a much better um, uh, cost economics. Um, the other thing that I would really point to here is, you know, modern platforms definitely allow organizations to leverage 
market available skills, right? The IT world has a ton of uh, data hubs that are either homegrown, built by um, specific consultants and organizations may not actually have uh, all the skills they need to manage those environments and, and, and modernize them and push them forward. Um, <clears throat> So what I would say is with a modern analytics platform built in the cloud, you can not only support kind of the existing workloads that you've already had with in-house market available skills, but you can also drive some new initiatives around data governance um, from a unified set of tools. And then I think lastly, really, because we are consolidating silos, um, you really do have an opportunity to achieve insight at any scale right? Um, you're no longer limited to just what you can manage and within your own environment. There's a bunch of tools in the tool set to allow you to do that. Now, all right, we've talked about modern analytics platforms. Makes sense. Like I said, I don't think anything I've said up till now is um, what you haven't probably heard before. But let's talk a little bit about mission critical systems, because this is really the core of the, the talk here, right? When we take a look at mission critical systems, how would you define them? Well, the way that we look at it precisely is as follows. Um, mission critical systems, as I see it, are systems that are deeply entrenched in the history of the business. Um, what that means is they may have been around for 10 years, they may have been around for 30 years, they may have been around for 50 years. Um, we actually see, you know, given our history, uh, we've got a big footprint within mainframe shops and those systems have been around 50 plus years. Um, they continue to run core business operations that directly impact revenue. So modernizing one of these systems or actually working with the data in those systems uh, needs to be done in such a way that you don't negatively impact your ongoing operations. Um, typically these are high visibility systems that have tight security restrictions in place. So there's a big, there's a very strong governance model around who is allowed to touch data in those systems, um, you know, how, in what way are they allowed to do that. But I think most importantly, if you add all these pieces up, a key thing to keep in mind is these systems actually contain really, really rich data assets. And those assets are constantly changing. You know, they are not static and they continue to be updated transactions continue to run through these systems. And so it's really, really important to actually make heads or tails of the data within them. Oftentimes I've, you know, and I think we've used this terminology precisely before in the past, but we often have used the term legacy systems, right? And I think legacy systems kind of slot into what I would define as mission critical here. Um, and really when you say legacy, I think a short answer for that is it's legacy because it works. It's got demonstrable value to the business um, and it's, uh, you know, it's going to continue to be a cornerstone of the IT landscape for that organization. So, all right, if these are our mission critical systems, let's dive into one specific set. And, and this one is really around the mainframe. Um, the mainframe is not a shrinking market. In fact, it is a, it is a growing market. Mainframe markets um, growing at two and a half percent, which most people, when we talk to them, you know, they generally think either the mainframe is gone or it's going to go away on some time bound horizon. Um, but in the interim, the mainframe market is continuing to grow. You know, we see a little bit of if you look at our customer base, we've got really two buckets of customers, I would say, at the, at the very high level who have mainframe. Bucket number one is, hey, I've got my mainframe. We've got a plan to retire it. And to do that, I need to first start, you know, migrating data off of it. And then, and, you know, that may be a five-year project, a 10-year project, whatever it looks like. And then bucket number two is, hey, I've got a mainframe and that thing is not going away, or at least there's no time bound horizon upon which it's going to go away. So instead, what I really need is the ability to uh, leverage the data that's generated by that platform more intelligently. Um, so that's what I should be, you know, th that's what I would say here. If you look at kind of um, 
what we see in the market with our customers. Uh, in fact, a BMC report uh, said back in 2019, mainframe transaction volumes grew 50% year over year, right? So, so this is a this is not just a, a growing market, but the fact that transaction volumes are actually going up are you know, is indicative of the fact that, hey, there's more data getting generated on these platforms than they have in the past. And it's imperative that organizations are set up to deal with the data from those platforms and, and work with it. All right, so let's, let's keep going here. Um, so the last thing I really wanna say here as I, as I make the case for this problem is, you know, how can this data then help contribute to an organization's success? So I see this shake out in terms of some key opportunities and then some impacts that, that necessarily that, that, that follow from it. So the opportunity number one, right? The, that second group of customers I spoke about, mission critical systems are generating data that's, and those systems are not necessarily going away. So the impact to your business is a need to reliably integrate this data at speed um, continues to grow. The second opportunity that I see is with these platforms is oftentimes a lot of historical data. We see a lot of mainframe customers dealing with historical data that might be siloed away on virtual tape, right? They're sitting on virtual tape libraries. It takes weeks to get access to any one data element. Um, and oftentimes you can't uh, build net new experiences or applications on top of that data just because it is so locked away. By unlocking this historical data, you can actually start to make some more decisions within a historical context. Um, it precisely, we're really focused on what we call data integrity. And data integrity is what we define as, you know, data that is accurate, it's consistent, and it's in context. That context could be in, uh, you know, location context, it could be historical context. And I think this is a key opportunity to help you make more informed decisions based on trusted data if you've got that historical context. And then lastly, really, it's around, uh, there's an opportunity here to get more comprehensive views of your various business entities, right? We, with, our, with some of our um, offerings in the data quality and the data governance space, we're oftentimes working on customer 360 use cases, um, single view of X type use cases. And, uh, Oftentimes bringing in this mission critical data can be very useful to successfully delivering on these types of projects. All right, with that said, then what are the challenges, right? All right, yeah, this makes sense. The, the, the opportunity makes sense. Um, but what are the key challenges? Uh, so we've done a couple of surveys in the market um, uh, precisely and these are the key challenges that respondents to our um, respondents to our surveys have highlighted. Uh, number one, really getting real time feeds of data. Um, the 451 research has uh, put out some numbers indicating that you know 37 percent of organizations have over a hundred data silos. Um, imagine trying to pull data and, and close those silos um, <clears throat> one by one, doing full loads of data. Most of our customers are looking to get more real-time insights into their different data silos. And so they're trying to implement things like change data capture, right? Um, leverage facilities like database logs, et cetera, in order to identify changes that are happening to those operational systems and, 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 and pull them together for uh, BI, for building net new applications, um, et cetera. Another key challenge that we saw was shortage of skills and staff. Um, specifically, shortage of skills that can span the complexity of an I-series or a mainframe environment, as well as a modern cloud stack built on uh, something like a Databricks, right? We, that, that seems to be a, a key struggle that we see organizations um, bump up against. Um, data accessibility, I think, ties into you know, this whole idea of eliminating data silos or putting in pipelines that help you deal with data silos. Um, budget, another key challenge for our customers. And the reason why is, you know, I say this often is that, hey, on the integration end, I'm focused on building pipes, 
They get data where it needs to be. And to be fair, most organizations are not worried about or not interested in investing their budget on maintenance around pipelines, right? They want to spend their budget on innovation and actually building value on top of the data. Um, poor data quality continues to be a challenge, right? Um, customers don't trust their data. Uh, it's either not, it's not consistent across systems, it's not accurate, or it doesn't necessarily have the fidelity and the context necessary to make decisions on. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll speak to here is scalability, right? How, how do you integrate this data and, and build data pipelines that can deal with the scale of your business both today, as well as uh, your expected growth tomorrow. So this is the set of challenges that we saw based on this, um, on this survey that we did. But there's one more challenge that I want to talk about and is what I feel like can get overlooked a little bit. And that challenge is really uh, cultural challenges. Cultural barriers within organizations are some things that, something that we see all the time. Um, and the reason why is as follows. I mean, typically in our experience, Organizations may embark on a, a data strategy where they are now, you know, let's say they're building out a lake house, um, leveraging uh, technology like Databricks, Azure Databricks. Um, typically, populating the data may start from some of the low hanging fruit, right? Talking to a SaaS endpoint is fairly straightforward, right? And yes, they evolve very quickly, but the data is well defined. It abides by a contract that, that the API specifies. And you know, onboarding it, there's a variety of tooling out there to, to assist with that. Typically, our customers will start there and then kind of work their way towards more of their mission critical systems. And time and time again, what I see is uh, our, our customers who work on the mainframe side of the house and who've got very large i-series footprint, um, they have teams responsible for those systems that are typically siloed from the data teams. They're siloed from the teams responsible for actually onboarding the data into the cloud native platform. And because of that, oftentimes there are limitations. And like I said, that governance model around who can install data, what ports can be open, who can actually directly access those platforms. And that can actually create some friction that can um, introduce uh, challenges in the data onboarding process. Um, you know, what we see sometimes is, hey, the mainframe team requires that no one touches the data that, that sits on the mainframe. And so, you know, they will might do batch uploads or batch exports of data assets that the, that the data team needs. You know, they'll do uh, kind of batch exports on a nightly basis which maybe that's fine for a while, but as organizations try to use data in, more, in a more real, real time or near real time basis, that doesn't quite work, right? A, a technology like change data capture might be necessary. And in order to implement a successful solution, oftentimes we need to work with customers on helping navigate and solve for any sort of cultural hurdles that they may, that they may run across. Um, in order to deliver a technically viable solution that meets the SLAs of the business, et cetera. So I think this one oftentimes doesn't get talked about as much, um, but we see it as a real challenge um, and a barrier towards success. All right, so I'm gonna outline and dive in, in detail into kind of four key steps that we implement with our customers as it relates to successfully leveraging mission critical data. And it's, it's four kinds of things here. Um, excuse me. So number one, right? Start small and identify some high value silos and, and start to work, uh, work to eliminate those. Number two, escape big, the delay of batching. Um, batching can be costly, right? Actually moving large amounts of data every single time you need data is expensive to do. Um, and it prevents you from building net new applications and using your data in a more proactive fashion as opposed to a reactive fashion. Um, you know, real-time data is only as good as how quickly it was delivered, right? Um, Identifying opportunities to scale up. So this is 
you know, one of the things that I see time and time again is once customers get some success with some initial data delivery and business teams can start using it, it actually just creates more demand. There's like a positive feedback loop that creates more demand for more variety, like a greater variety of data. And then the last piece that, that again, we kind of help customers with here is finding ways to modernize existing applications. So we'll, we'll now jump into each one of these in a little bit more detail, but this is kind of the framework I'm gonna walk through next. All right, so, so eliminating silos, that's, that was the first one that I mentioned. Um, key things that we help our customers with when it comes to eliminating silos, right? Try to leverage standard connectivity protocols wherever possible. Seems like a no brainer, but oftentimes with these um, mission critical systems, that can be more difficult than, than you might expect. Um, I mentioned the example before of, you know, uh, more of a manual process where team A does kind of a, uh, a periodic dump of data from what, from systems that the data team actually requires. Well, typically how we deal with that is we try to leverage whatever standard connectivity protocol may exist, be it, you know, JDBC for some sort of um, database, SFTP for remote file system, or when it comes to the mainframe specifically, FTPS, because F SFTP is not fully implemented for the, the ZOS um, subsystem um, and doesn't kind of have all the, the knobs that you need, or even Connect Direct. Um, that's the old NDM product. You know, we try to leverage those standard connectivity protocols where poss wherever possible, given they are well understood, can be governed, et cetera. Another key thing, leveraging existing metadata can be kind of difficult, especially as it relates to the mainframe. Um, copy books are great. They provide really, really good metadata. Um, but, you know, oftentimes the problem with that is, um, you know, mainframe data doesn't necessarily tightly map to what a copy book may look like. You may have a numeric field um, defined in the copy book. But in reality, when you look at the vSAM data set under the covers, the data itself does not quite match up with the numeric data type that the copy book is telling you. So while um, leveraging existing metadata is hugely useful and prevents you from having to reinvent the wheel when it comes to data interpretation, um, and it also promotes reusability, keep in mind that oftentimes you may need more data quality in there to help deal with data that may stick out, right? Uh, ensuring encryption of data, in flight at every point in the journey, again, kind of table stakes with these um, with these cloud use cases, but again, important. And I think lastly, um, we see our most successful customers have a flexibility when it comes to how they're de delivering their data, right? Several of them may just do a one-way type replication from source to target. Others may broadcast where they want to have one feed of data going into their warehouse and then another feed kind of going straight into some sort of streaming bus for more real-time applications. Um, some may use a combination, but again, we, we oftentimes will work with our customers very closely in terms of figuring out, hey, for your use case and the outcomes you're targeting, what is the best um, data delivery topology or combination of topologies to leverage? And the next thing I would say is replicating data at the speed of business. Um, you know, if you're building a net new application that is looking to improve customer experience, uh, real-time data or near real-time data delivery is becoming, you know, is important. Um, one of the things that I see working with our customers is a lot of them are starting to treat data availability the way that our HA customers kind of treat uh, infrastructure availability, right? They you know, I've got customers that, you know, say 500 milliseconds between event on my operational system and delivery within my target system is too much, um, right? So definitely seeing more of an increase and more, more pressure on data delivery speed. Um, so key things to, to leverage here, um, log-based change data capture techniques, very, very useful, right? They help us identify transactions as they commit or as they occur. Um, we're able to minimize our impact to those online backends and try to use whatever mechanisms may exist, right? If it's DB2 on the mainframe, 
It's an ISIP 306 interface or it's a VSAM data set. It could be CICS controlled. We'll use CICS. Um, we can use journals on the I series, redo and archive logs in an Oracle environment. But the key point here is kind of leverage um, what's available to you to, to identify changes um, and then perform the data translation and conversion off platform wherever possible. This is really important for those critical environments that are pushing through lots of transactions, right? So if you're talking about a mainframe environment, perform zip offloading where possible. Um, you know, by doing our conversion off platform, we decrease the load on those platforms. So we don't actually impact the online application. Um, we've actually, you know, we're doing this in our customer environments. In certain cases, we've got, you know, customers pushing a billion and a half transactions in a four hour and in a four hour window, right? So it's these these data volumes are serious and it's one of those things where we actually we adopt these practices in order to scale to the needs of the business so with that i would say like i mentioned before um, successful data delivery drives increased demand that's what i see time and time again uh, and it's not a linear journey from one thing to another, right? We see customers enter in at various points in the journey. A lot of our customers we see start by, you know, saying, hey, I've got this imperative to, um, to have more of a real-time insight into my customer behavior. And so I'm going to leverage the change data capture technique we talked about before in conjunction with a platform like Kafka. So I can build a real-time so I can build a real-time application, right? That, that then is built off of Kafka. We see other customers say, you know what? I've got this existing warehousing process that I want to modernize. Today I've deployed this um, in my data center. I'm responsible for allocating, you know, not just um, software, but also hardware requirements, I have to maintain it and it doesn't quite scale to what I need, I can't easily share data. So they may start out their journey with um, a use case with Snowflake, right? Um, but typically, like I said before, successful data delivery and on time, fast data delivery drives increased demand for more data. So we'll oftentimes then see customers expand to multiple targets, right? So they may ad adopt like a broadcast technology to send data to both Snowflake and Kafka at the same time, or they may even leverage um, the hyperscaler platform to drive a new use case around modernizing existing applications. Um, and actually on that note, what I would say here is there, you know, once you kind of ex eliminated these silos, set up these real-time pipelines and feeds of data from the operational system into the cloud platform, um, there's a couple of things that you can then do. You can actually now, you know, modernize more than just data. Um, there's a couple of forms that this could take, right? Um, specifically when it comes to the mainframe, one of the things that, that we often work with customers on is migrating some of their uh, mainframe sort applications, right? So they've got um, sort applications, they may be moving it into a rehosting environment built on something like MicroFocus. Um, you know, in addition to replicating the data, we may act as kind of the sort accelerator for them under the covers as they migrate those applications. You know, it was written a while back. We don't want to rebuild it. It's not, the, there's no business case to rewrite it in a, you know, in a more modern language, um, but it's still really important. And I want to just kind of lift and shift it. That's kind of, that's that set of um, modernization that I would speak to. The other kind of modernization that I would say um, change data capture assists with is around, is around rebuilding an application, right? So almost leveraging data integration technologies to serve like an application integration use case. So in this example, what I mean is, let's say you've got application A, running on um, on an i-series platform and you want to kind of migrate it to a more modern stack inside of aws well if the you know application generating the data is going to continue running on the i-series we can actually use change data capture to replicate that data out into aws into a variety of different endpoints if it's you know Kafka is the one that we see is most popular, but it could be a database just as easily. You know, it provides an opportunity to now 
now that you've got a real time feed of data from the generating application on the i series you can now rebuild a, an application running natively on aws using that real time data feed um, that's something that we've done with customers before you know they they typically will rebuild the application but um, by doing, by performing that data integration and serving as that data pipeline from source to target, um, we can help facilitate that process, make it easier. So with that, I actually do want to jump into a customer story that kind of shows this um, in action. Um, so this is with Sky TV. Um, Sky TV was in a uh, in digital transformation mode, right? There's a C-level initiative to kind of consolidate tool sets, move a lot of their operations and analytics into their AWS environment. And Sky had standardized on Snowflake on AWS as being their core, um, being their core platform for analytics on AWS and, and BI. Now, like I mentioned earlier, they were doing just fine kind of onboarding a lot of their different data assets, but they actually hit a wall when it came to their mission critical data. Now their mission critical data consisted of, you know, business critical assets such as their billing application, subscriber management, chart of accounts, all of that runs on their IBMI. Um, and each one of those had their own file structure. So actually building some sort of ETL process was not going to work for them. They actually had an old legacy ETL process that they built for themselves. You know, it was bespoke, but it was, it, it was inflexible, right? Um, it took four to 10 hours to run each job, um, was prone to network issues if there are outages. But this is going to become a worse problem when they were trying to go from ground to cloud, right? Um, so it, it was just not feasible to kind of take this and reorient it towards a more cloud native um, model built on Snowflake. So what they really wanted was they had they wanted something that would feed data into Snowflake more automated um, without having to impact IT, really allow IT to focus more on kind of high value contributions to the business. And so they actually leveraged um, precisely our Connect solution in conjunction with Snowflake to do this. Um, so essentially, they, they deployed Connect, um, leveraged our change data capture technology on the iSeries to actually identify changes that were happening on that operational platform. And then we replicated that out to Snowflake on AWS. Um, what this ultimately allows for them to do is now share with sales a more current view of subscriber behavior, right? They're no longer delayed by four to 10 hours for these ETL processes to run if they even ran successfully. Um, the data delivery is more automated. It's more near real time. And IT is actually freed up now. They're no longer stuck kind of building and maintaining some of these slow running um, batch ETL processes, right? They're now, they're no longer rebuilding stuff. They can onboard new data assets in, you know, minutes to hours instead of writing new code. Um, and they're no longer tied to batch windows. That four to 10 hours now occurs transaction by transaction, um, leveraging, um, leveraging connect, right? So they can deliver data now in minutes. And now they can start doing some more innovation on top of Snowflake, building new applications, leaving the IBMI backends running unchanged. So the IBMI still runs their business. All those business critical systems continue to run there. Um, and the data is served to Snowflake and can be opened up to a variety of different lines of business, not just sales. So that silo is broken down. It's driving a need for more data for, you know, from their IT teams. And they're, they're able to deliver on this digital transformation initiative. So I think the you know, key takeaways I'd stress here, I really do see these mission critical data assets as being uh, critical to helping organizations fulfill the promises of digital modernization. It's great to be able to onboard data from, you know, kind of modern data sources. Um, and it's, it's a great way to start proving out value. But I don't think the promise is fulfilled until you've solved for the complexity and the variety and the velocity of all your different data within the enterprise. I don't think that promise gets fulfilled until you've tackled this last, last leg of the journey. Um, I think the other thing I would stress here as a takeaway is 
the challenges that we see organizations face time and time again, yes, they are technical, but there are also organizational challenges that need to be solved for. Number three, I would say, prove out and get some early wins. Um, like I said, successful data delivery just drives demand for more data. And typically we're seeing our most successful customers have moved to near real time data delivery wherever possible. And then I think the last piece here, right, is, you know, once you've unlocked that data, there's an opportunity to intelligently modernize your applications, be it kind of doing a lift and shift with like a mainframe sort card rehosting type application or, you know, rebuilding something that may be more strategic that you want to, uh, that you want to surface, right? There, there are a bunch of different opportunities. And, you know, we have precisely would love to chat with you about opportunities to do that, best practices that we've seen work at other customers and, and more. Um, we do work with, you know, 99 of the Fortune 100 and we've got over 12,000 customers globally. So we've definitely seen a lot of different patterns play out over the years. Um, and we'd love to chat with you on that. Um, so with that, I, let me turn it over to, to questions. I think, Shen, you may be uh, <clears throat> monitoring hey, the, <laughs> yeah. the thing as well. Uh, I, uh, yeah, if you have questions for Ashwin, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. Uh, and just a reminder, just answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Uh, so diving in here, Ashwin, um, what were the sources uh, for the growth trends data that you showed? Yeah, so we got some of the data from uh, a couple of BNC reports. The, um, the skills information was through a survey that, that Precisely conducted, and then some of the market projections, I believe. Um, I have to double check that. I believe it was through markets and markets, but I can double check that. And I'll give everyone just a moment here to answer, to submit any additional questions that they have. Um, so Ashwin, in this uh, perspective, you know, what's the biggest aha moment that your customers find when they install precisely to solve these problems? That's a good question. Um, I think the, the biggest aha moment for our customers is I think how how data integration can be an enabler, um, right? So I, I think I talked about how, you know, data delivery can drive more demand, right? Or, you know, success begets success, the positive feedback loop. Um, but I think it's interesting how, how quickly we'll see customers identify new use cases because, you know, they've successfully onboarded this really complex, um, they successfully onboarded this really complex data asset. They're now doing it at scale and seeing them kind of identify new use cases is probably the most interesting thing once they've deployed us, right? And that could be a new use case in the integration space that involves precisely. That could be um, a new use case that's completely unrelated to precisely, but it's something new they can do with the data. Or it could also be kind of a third category where they actually identify a deficiency in their existing kind of data management, um, you know, in, in their kind of data management architecture where they may realize, you know what, we don't quite have the observability into our data that we thought we did. Um, we may, you know, need to more closely modify, or sorry, may, may need to more closely monitor kind of our data, the quality of it, and figure out how we take corrective action on it. So there are other kind of data integrity challenges that come up that I've seen time and time again after they've successfully deployed us, right? So it's pretty interesting the kind of mix, the mix of reactions we'll typically see. That's amazing. Uh, again, I want to give everyone a little uh, opportunity to, to submit any questions in the Q&A portion. Uh, anything you want to add, Ashwin, anything that you uh, felt that you didn't dive into enough or or that commonly comes up? Yeah, I, maybe the, the other thing I would just mention here um, is, you know, I, th I think I spoke today about the about what we do with our customers on on premises, right, in terms of um, you know, in terms of what we do with 
our on-prem connect product, we talked about the sky use case. One of the trends that we're seeing increasingly with our customer base is, you know, as they're moving their warehousing to SaaS offerings, uh, as they're moving a lot of their different, um, as they're working with kind of a lot of different data, they also want to start moving their integration to more of a um, SaaS type deployment model. Um, and so that's kind of where our data integrity suite is coming in. Um, so if you've been following precisely or you've heard of us, you may have heard about our data integrity suite. And really what it is, it's a, it's a set of interoperable modules that help customers deliver on key data integrity initiatives. Um, and so we've actually taken this core integration capability and, and, and brought it into our data integrity suite. Um, so, you know, whether you want to deploy these capabilities as, you know, software, uh, as software in your environment, or whether you want to use our data integrity suite, we can actually help you solve these process. We can help you solve these processes, um, you know, in a very holistic fashion based on the needs of your business. Um, you know, we leverage a hybrid architecture so you can kind of maintain ownership of your data as it's moved around. But it's, it's one of those exciting growth areas for us. So it is another thing I just would want to uh, call attention to as well. Perfect. And we do have some questions coming in now. So Ashwin, you know, with respect to cybersecurity, thoughts on risks that may or can be overlooked? It's a good question. I, I think I'm going, I, I think I see this one increasingly coming up um, with our public cloud use cases. So we've got, you know, a good number of customers who today are, like I said, building a net new application in AWS, for example, based on data that's coming from their mainframe backends in the data center. Um, and increasingly what they're trying to do is they're trying to put together an extra layer of security specifically around um, application level encryption, right? So the data in flight on the wire, yeah, it's encrypted while we you know, replicate it out, but once it lands, they wanna be able to protect PII data so that way, even if someone were inspecting that data, say within Kafka, um, only those authorized to work with that data could actually decrypt it, detokenize it, et cetera. So, so that's one of those areas that I do see, um, you know, we see customers dealing with that today. We're working on some solutions of precisely and, and putting some thinking around how we can help customers with that kind of application level encryption while maintaining the performance that we're known for. Um, but that's one area that I think is important to keep in mind, right? Um, I think the other thing, just as it relates to data security, is <clears throat> you know having a good handle on where your data is being processed. So when I um, talked about our data integrity suite before, I mentioned that it is a SaaS offering, but we actually do have more of a hybrid SaaS flexibility with deploying data integration pipelines. So you can actually manage it in your data center um, or in your private cloud or in your public cloud VPC, right? We don't actually touch your data. So I think that's an important thing to consider as well, right? Because we work with really heavily regulated mainframe environments where you can't have the public cloud just touching the mainframe, right? Um, so that's kind of another area where we see some customer, some good customer be, customer feedback from and interesting use cases around. I like it. So how is it that precisely CDC can integrate with operational mainframe data without adversely impacting that performance, that platform's performance? That's a good question. Um, so we, we typically, I think it's, there's two mechanisms, right? Or there's two key things I would stress. Number one, just kind of leveraging the facilities the mainframe provides us without putting any kind of, um, you know, mainframes got things like different user exits and whatever that can oftentimes choke performance. So we try to stay away from that wherever possible. That's number one. So that, you know, protects the, the application itself. Um, the other piece that I think I mentioned before um, on the slide is really being uh, intentional about where the data processing happens. So copy book mapping, abcidic to Unicode translation, you know, data type translations, all that kind of stuff, record parsing, you know, all that's 
fairly CPU intensive and to do that on the mainframe would definitely drive up your MIPS consumption. Um, so by doing that off platform, we, we help kind of uh, reduce the cost of doing this kind of a workload and, and, and protecting the mainframe. But, you know, if, if there is more, uh, you know, desire to go more in depth on it, we're happy to have a in-depth call with our technical team. Love it. So, um, Ashwin, do you uh, work with SAP data like you do mainframe and IBM I? Uh, yeah. Um, so, so we we do have a fairly large SAP business actually. Um, for those who may not be familiar, we actually acquired um, Wind Shuttle last year, um, and they've got a really compelling set of capabilities uh, in the SAP automation space. Um, and so we do have some interesting integration use cases that we perform with SAP to help customers automate their business processes and things of that nature. Um, you know, we're obviously continuing to work with customers around potentially new use cases to um, help with uh, analytics and things like that with SAP data. Um, but that's something we're currently working on. And from an environmental, social, and or governance perspective, to what degree does precisely facilitate an organization's ability to address any of its components? Uh, that's great. Um, so we do not, you know, we don't have an ESG offering, right? But our tools um, and, and what we offer from a data integrity perspective does help um, companies address ESG initiatives. I would say specifically as it relates to some of our data. So we uh, precisely as a fairly large data business um, where we help, can help provide third-party data around, um, you know, around a variety of different things, be it dynamic weather, um, demographics, um, you know, and a, and a whole host of things kind of, um, we acquired a business called Place IQ that works kind of in the I believe in the marketing space. So I would say definitely the auxiliary third-party data that we offer can be put towards these kind of ESG initiatives. And we do have a couple of you know field teams who work with our customers on helping facilitate these kinds of initiatives. Um, but I would say our, our core uh, technology is not an ESG technology. We help support those initiatives through the data integrity um, messaging essentially. A good question. We, yes, indeed. We have done a, quite a few webinars with precisely on governance and the capabilities of data governance within the, the tool. Yep. Um, very nice. Well, that's currently all the questions that we have right now. Uh, anything you want to wrap up with, Ashwin, before I give some people some time back? Yeah, I, I think that's all, that's all I had. I mean, really hope this session was useful to you all. And I appreciate the, uh, the time and the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any uh, challenges or, or needs in the you know, data integrity space around integration, data governance, data enrichment, LI, data quality and observability. You know, we're happy to help. Um, it's, it's what keeps us getting up for work every day. You know, it's, it's a pretty exciting space to be in. So again, thanks for the time and the opportunity to present to you. Indeed. Thank you so much. And thanks to Precisely for sponsoring today's webinar. Again, just a reminder to everybody, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Ashwin, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.